take one billion. <laughs> Why are some of the... <laughs> <laughs> Why are some of the most interesting products designed in Silicon Valley? In this video, you're going to find out. What you're about to see is an excerpt from the Product Breakfast Club podcast, where we talk about the difference between Silicon Valley and the rest of the world when it comes to designing products. Hope you enjoy it. And if you like these kind of conversations, definitely check out the Product Breakfast Club podcast. <laughs> Love from San Francisco. <laughs> Silicon Valley, the Val, S Val, as we call it here. The Val, the Val. <laughs> I know a lot of people listening to this podcast are listening from the Bay Area. I can see that in the analytics, but I also know that most of the people who listen to this are not working in the Bay Area. And often when I mention on any of the Instagram posts or YouTube posts, when I talk about Silicon Valley, there is this general kind of, what is it? And like, what's so special about it? And in Germany, and I guess a lot of parts of the world, there's an anti-Silicon Valley kind of oh, vibe. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's just it's stupid. It is a super interesting topic for me, having just come back. Yeah, you've just been steeped in it. You've been up to your chin. Yeah, up to my actual chin. <laughs> and I think like I was up to my knees last time because I was just training well-known right. Silicon yeah, yeah, Valley yeah. companies. This time I was deep inside these companies that everyone knows and working on products, right? And working on what they actually bring to the market and what makes them so special. There are a lot of things that are similar to yeah. working anywhere else in the world, but there are really, really, really clear differences as well. Like there are some things that I think they just don't exist, especially in Europe, because we were in New York as well three weeks ago. And there were definitely some things that we chatted about in terms of people being enthusiastic about yeah. the brand. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like a big difference to Europe where a lot of people are not necessarily super enthusiastic about the brand that they're working for. And they're almost cynical. They would never say the sentence, I'm going to change the world or this project is going to change the world. <laughs> yeah. They would never say that with a straight face. Whereas you're required to say that in the United States yeah. 20 times at the beginning of every meeting. <laughs> we will change the world with this brand. We will change the world. We will change the world. But maybe I heard the sentence. Maybe I heard it like three times. Like this is a product that could change the world. This is something that could change the world. I know a lot of people will roll their eyes here of course. listening to this. You can almost hear the eye rolls yeah. happening. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's something in that that makes me super excited yeah. that the people working on these products are like, they're not just like, ah, oh, I'm making this new flyout panel on the side here. Yeah. It's like they often have the big picture in mind the way a lot of people don't at other companies from other countries. Interesting. So they're thinking about how this fits into the bigger world of things. Super often. Yeah. It really is so cheesy to think that you can yeah. change the world. You're not changing the world with that thing. Well, very few products really do change the world. And so many of the things that people say are going to change the world in tech don't. And it's a way of sometimes making things sound important that really aren't. But there also is something really powerful about being very wholehearted in your work, going like all in. This is one of the tactics in Make Time Book. By Make Time. By Make Time by Sprint. Is to just like go like all in on the thing, to let go of like being cool and like let go of like holding back a little bit or like reserving a little energy and just go for it. Just go throw yourself into what you're doing. You get so much better results when you can do that. And you have more energy when you can do that. Like everything yeah. goes better when you can go all in. You can't always go all in. Sometimes there are projects that really suck. And like, but I always think like if you can't go all in, then maybe it's like something you should try to like not be doing. Like you should try to change the work that you're doing. And so, yeah, I think that it is more culturally acceptable and even encouraged to like be all in on what you're doing here. And there's something to that. Oh, I'm getting a coffee and water delivery oh. from my son, Flynn. Oh, I'm going to get oatmeal in just a second. This is really the product breakfast club this morning because it's breakfast time here. I hadn't even eaten. Oh, you know what? Actually, this is a really good tangent here. In episode... I think it was episode 39 in New York, our first one from New York. Oh, I was, love that episode. It was really good. That was like My the best favorite. episode. We were so good. That was like Monday of that week. And yeah. Then episode 41 is like Friday, maybe? Um, Thursday or Friday? I think it was uh, th uh, just before going into the sprint on Friday morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had not had coffee that morning. And I listened to that episode and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> is something wrong with the audio? <laughs> because my voice was so slow. And it was just like, hello, hello. 
<laughs> and I could almost hear myself like trying to think. And you'd like say something. I was like, ah, like the gears were just turning. And I don't know. It was some combination of that was an intense week. Yeah. I hadn't had coffee yet. Anyway, it'll be interesting to see. I just got coffee. I have not had coffee mm. yet this morning. We'll halfway see through the episode. Halfway through the episode. This is like a good test. We could always have Jason perhaps go back and just speed my speech up a little bit so that it's just <laughs> normalized. Please don't know? do that, Jason. Because <laughs> remember, he's actually doing the things that we request. <laughs> we love you, Jason. Oh, Jason's Jason best. is the editor of this podcast, by the way, in case you hear us referring. And you could say producer as well. He's just everything. So, Jake, what I wanted to go back to, so have a little yes. nibble of your oatmeal there or a sip of your coffee. One of the things that my company has been thinking about for a while is like, how do we figure out what our company values are? And how do we kind of instill them in new employees? And how do we use them oh, as yeah. almost like a way to help people to figure out how to solve problems based on values? So it's not like every single time a specific challenge comes up that everyone has to solve it from scratch every time. But they can be like, oh, well, AJ and Smart is a company that usually does this, this, and this. For example, we're a company that doesn't really pursue short-term large amounts of money. We generally try to take it really big hit in profit for long-term revenue or long-term brand equity, whatever, whatever. And I think in Silicon Valley, what I noticed with all of the companies that I was at in the last two weeks was... Their company values were highly visible yeah. everywhere you went, but in a way that people actually referred to them in a non-cynical way. Yeah, this is the that's difference. interesting. Yeah, I've never right, seen right. that anywhere yeah. else. Right, because as you were saying that just now, honestly, you may not believe me now because you already gave away the thing being about values. I was thinking you should have some company values. Yeah. But of course, company values sounds really like cheesy company values. Who cares? Company values, they have the potential to be really great. And I would say the place that made me believe that was Google. At Google, the company values were like, they were really good and they were opinionated and people really like thought about them and and would, would you know, sort of quote them. Like, yeah, they had this thing called 10 things we found to be true that was really powerful because it was about things that they had distilled from what worked about the products. And so, so I can't remember which of these things are like company values and which of them come from 10 things we've found to be true. But I remember like, I know don't be evil is like sort of a motto or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like it's a good one. People joke about that all the time and Google has gotten so big and it's a really good motto. And I've been yeah. inside companies where there's not a sense of don't be evil. It's not that people are evil, but the conversations very quickly become very calculated about the business and you stop treating customers like your friends, like humans, you know, which is really unfortunate. And it's not to say that Google's always going to do things perfectly and that they're always not going to be evil, but it's a lot better to try. But this 10 things we found to be true was really interesting because it was distilled from what had actually worked. So you knew that there was some history behind it. You knew it wasn't just hollow. It's like, this is what has worked for us in the past. And it was right. like, if we build products and we start off by thinking about the customer first, we don't care about how we're going to make money, but first we try to make the best product possible, then that focus on the customer ends up being a competitive advantage for us. And that was true for them for like, it's true for Google itself, like the search engine, like it did not start off monetized and they tried to make the best thing possible for customers. And then they figured out how to make money off of it. I can't remember how this was phrased, but like it really matters like how fast things are. We found that that is true. We found that it's true that you should like show how fast things are. I don't know if they still consider this one of their things, but this used to be on their website publicly. You could just find it. You said that these things are like things that the company has found to be true in the past and they're almost like codifying them. I think that a lot of companies fail, including us, when we try to make values because you try to make them extremely aspirational. It's like you're making them not what your company is, but what the executive team wants the company to be. And I think that like having values that are just purely aspirational makes people roll their eyes because they're like, you know what? We're just not like that. That isn't what we're like, but fuck it. We'll just like ignore it anyway. Whereas I think a lot of the values that you just mentioned there are values that are based on past successes. And that's something that people can get behind a little bit better. Yeah, I found the list. It's really easy to find. It's 10 things we know to be true. Now it's called oh. we know to be true. It used to be found. It used to be we found. I'm getting more hardcore. Getting more hardcore. Getting more confident. Young Google is getting quite confident. Young Google. <laughs> Number one, focus on the user and all else will follow. Boring. Number two, it's best to do one thing really, really well, which is pretty funny because they don't do that anymore. <laughs> Hell um, no. They said, we do search. 
when I joined the company, that was, we're really good at search. We do these other things are like side projects. Three, fast is better than slow. Four, democracy on the web works. Five, you don't need to be at your desk to need an answer. So this is just like talking about like mm. we think mobile is important. This is interesting because it's still on their website. I would guess that this is like 15 plus years old. Six, you can make money without doing evil. Seven, there's always more information out there. Eight, the need for information crosses all borders. Nine, you can be serious without a suit. And 10, great just isn't good enough. Some of them may be less impactful than others. I focus on the user and I also follow. It was like hugely sticky. People talked about it, believed that. It's best to do one thing really, really well was also, that's a really strong one. Fast is better than slow. There's so many times when you make a decision in anything that you do, whether it's a company or whatever, but you make a decision when you're trying to market something, when you're trying to like promote something, where you have to consciously make the decision to be honest and fair. And I think making the right decision in those cases is actually like important for the long-term health of the business. You can, whether it's moral or not, it's actually like the best thing for the business. But the expedient thing to do in the moment is often not... To be honest, not yeah. to be 100% forthcoming, 100% yeah. clear. Like if you've worked with a client and you're like, okay, so should we exaggerate what our relationship was with this client? Like should right. we exaggerate what the results were? Like the expedient thing in the moment may be to exaggerate it. But in the long term, like if the client finds out like, oh, we exaggerated what we did. like, And, and even just the fact that we allow that non-truth to kind of be out there that also like could start to pervade other things that we do and totally like, our sort of reputation like becomes sullied by that you know that stuff it does totally matter anyway getting a little fired up here and i've only even had one tiny sip <laughs> of my coffee <laughs> it's also just i mean I, I can see it within aj and smart i mean a lot of the company values are not codified, not written down, but gut feelings based on what people think I might want to happen or my co-founder might want to happen. And of course, just having it out there and a bit more clearly, I think is something just that last two, it was actually Tim. Tim was also there in, in the valley. And he was the one who was like, it's actually not stupid to have these values now that he saw it working in these companies, or at least not necessarily working, but it was being used as like a common frame of reference, I guess you could say. Yeah. So even when everything else is falling apart and no one's aligned on anything, <laughs> yeah. at least you can kind of align around, okay, well, this is what the business is about. And these are our kind of core values. And it definitely helped certain decisions get made faster, even within the sprint, when the decider was able to say, the reason I'm choosing this concept and this concept is because we know that the company values are blah, 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 blah. And I feel like this not only fits with the sprint question, sprint goal, but I think it's also the thing that fits most closely to our core values. And I was like, I've never had that happen in a sprint before. I just had a weird thought, which is, I wonder if, because in America, as you probably noticed, America, America, we don't have as much cultural norms as other countries do. And like, it's a weakness in many ways of like, if you live here, there are a lot of things you have to sort of make up from scratch. Like there are not just the same thing that you do. For example, in Berlin, I feel like I observed in my short time there this summer, for example, having like a beer with each other in the evening, sitting outside, it seems like a thing friends do. And they're just talking like people yeah. aren't really on their phones. They're actually just talking or like in cafes, just kind of like, oh, let's get together and like kind of talk and hang out. I, people do that in the United States, but it felt like there was more of like everybody was doing it at once kind of a thing or like. Yeah. Yeah. People being out late in Berlin, right? Like people go out and like they do stuff with their friends. There's like this norms. There are things kind of like this, but you go to different countries in Europe, you'll see there's a cultural thing that's developed. And Berlin's probably not even the best example because it's sort of a weird place and obviously a lot of upheaval there over the last century. But if you go to other cities, you'll see like, oh, yeah, man, there's these traditions. People have been doing these yeah. things forever. There are countrywide traditions. Religion yeah. is like rolled into it, right? Like just this like, oh, man, there's these big time traditions. And in the United States, we have so many people from all over the world. It's like a relatively new country. Like we don't have as many cultural norms established. And I think that one of the reasons why people might get more into their companies and like these ideas of the principles of the companies is because we kind of long for a culture and like the companies can create this culture that's like it becomes a culture that you live in. I live in the Google culture. I live in the like whatever culture, you know, it's like, yeah, good. Finally, somebody's telling me what to do. Somebody's giving me some moral guidelines, you know, yeah. somebody's like giving me something to be excited about and that maybe there's something to that. I'm not mentioning any of the companies we worked with, so I'm just keeping it extremely vague. But 
I was inside a couple of companies which were... Every time you say company, I'm just going to say... .com. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was inside a couple of companies that were in the spotlight. All of these companies have been in the spotlight recently over all sorts of things, all sorts of like big scandals. It was also really interesting to see that from the inside, how people were sort of banding together. There wasn't like this like horrible vibe of oh my god this company's evil and we should really get out of here or i don't know you know like i was worried that there might be like a really bad vibe around all the bad things that had been happening in the media but generally and something that you and i had talked about before generally the people working in these companies genuinely want to fix these problems that people have and genuinely want to be good right and it's just there are some really sticky problems that like obviously you know websites like the verge see a company doing something bad and they're like, the CEO of that company is evil. I guess it's just good clickbait. But there's absolutely no effort put into thinking about what it is actually like to run a company. The Verge has, I think right now on the front page, it's one of the big two social media companies with a line through it saying that basically this company is wrong. Oh, I want to see this. This is on the homepage right now. Oh, they've changed the headline to be less intense. This had a more extreme headline a few days ago. It's fine to report on this stuff, but there's rarely any effort into interviewing employees of these companies in senior positions. I guess also these companies don't want to allow them to be interviewed. But when they do get interviewed, they also get like attacked on the internet. I think it's interesting just being inside and seeing the kind of other side of this that these people working in these companies are not like, ha ha, how can we get more people angry? And ha ha, how can we trick more people? Yeah, it's an important perspective. This is actually another make time thing. We tried really careful to figure out like, how should we talk about this? Because there is a lot of negativity around tech companies and their effect on our attention, their effect on whether the information that we consume and it actually is really important too. It's an important duty that the press has and that to sort of like push on these guys and like they do have like a ton of real estate, they have a ton of money. Like it's important for people to criticize them. Actually, yeah, it's really good that people do. There's also a perspective that's important to note, which is that these companies, and I think generally speaking, they are very sincere. The people who work there are very sincere in their efforts to try to do the right thing. They want to make good products. There are sometimes reasons why they can't. The companies aren't always motivated by mm. pure sunshine and happiness. But generally speaking, if you go inside those companies, you're going to find people who want to make the world better and want to bring kind of the future to life. And oh, here's another delivery. For- oh, here comes the oatmeal. No one's bringing me shit. I don't have a kid yet, but... Uh, it's a love heart and a smiley face, which says dad twice on it. I think it's for me. It's for you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Cool. Thanks, Flynn. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to get some chewing sounds. Folks building these products mean well. And I think yeah. that I hope that in the long term, when they're pushed on from the outside, that like the result will be more awareness and that they will do the right thing and that they yeah. won't be like cigarette companies. I don't mean to like diss cigarette companies, but I will. I will diss cigarette companies. Sorry. If you work at a cigarette company, I think you should just get another job. They don't believe that the thing is harmful. They actually want to find a way to make their products do good for people. And so the thing is, it gets reduced to this really simple idea of like, oh, the companies are bad. We should punish them or regulate them into submission or like shut it off or whatever. And the reality is like just much more nuanced. Like they're trying to do something good. It's hard to come up with these new technologies and things that serve Mm. us well. And then like we as people using those things also have a responsibility to figure out how to use them in a way that helps, that gets the best. You saw inside like the folks are generally trying to do the right thing and it's hard. It's good for us to hammer on them from the outside. But I mean, it's a mixture of, I guess the things that are the same For me, going to Silicon Valley is extremely important. It's extremely important for me to bring the AJ and Smart team to Silicon Valley as regularly as possible because, number one, the expectations are higher, actually, for us. The companies that bring us in have to the point of unrealistic expectations from us, which we actually kind of like because it pushes us really, really hard. Say a little bit more about that. What do you mean? So many companies that we work for they didn't come to the market as a digital software company in the first place. And 
they're trying to get into that now. Many of the companies we work for are old businesses that they're just trying to figure out today, how do I build these product teams? How do I innovate? How do I create these huge scalable products that hit the market and just like succeed like crazy? Well, it's Europe, right? I mean, they probably started off making like armor or like armor. coins. Absolutely. Exactly. Or, coins. Uh, old fashioned weapons. Birkenstock pipes. shoes. Birkenstock shoes. Exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> What they're looking for from us is obviously to help them figure out their product vision, their product strategy, and also then potentially design their product, help them figure out how to bring it to the market. We are obviously like very well suited to do that. And it's also not just European companies. That's also basically any company, even the ones we worked with in New York, I would consider those to be a company that they're in a state of transition at the moment. Right. right. That's like the most common type of company we work with. In Silicon Valley, they're not in a state of transition. They started in this like digital world. The majority of people who have worked there right now are digital natives who are, I would almost say, like product natives. They understand everything about products. There's nothing you can really say to, in any way, get a reaction. Someone being like, oh, you know about growth and blah, blah, blah. Like, think of a shit. They know all that stuff already. <laughs> they're also like, it's a highly, highly, highly competitive market there in the Bay Area. It's bubbling up like very intensely motivated people who work a lot and work a lot on their education. And it's, it's like a combination of that makes them have extremely high expectations of an external company coming in to help them. What the fuck are we doing going into these companies? You know, like this external company from Berlin. Silicon Valley doesn't really care about Europe, right? It's not like a super interesting, maybe just if you want to go and like not really work anymore. But in terms of like level of innovation, all of this kind of stuff, I think Silicon Valley would see Europe as like a second class citizen. And so for us going over there, it really, really, first of all, we all get really nervous. <laughs> like everyone in AJ and Smart's <laughs> like, oh God, like they're after booking us. <laughs> we have to do it. And it, it just like, it makes us look at a lot of our systems. It makes us look at the skill sets we have. It also gives us huge confidence and excitement boosts when we manage to deliver something that excites them, right? I'm always shocked when these clients are like, oh my God, I can't believe you guys did that. And then they rebook us. So going over there for us as a European company, and I would honestly recommend this for anybody not having visited the Bay Area before. It's completely contagious enthusiasm for the product, like product as a topic. Everyone knows everything about products there. You just meet a random person on the street and they'll talk about monthly active users or something, right? You'll be like, stop talking to me. And they're like, monthly active <laughs> users. <laughs> monthly active <laughs> MAUs, motherfucker. It's an extremely mature product environment. That's it. That's the difference. And I think there's not so many places in the world where also like the types of companies which you don't find anywhere else right here and even in new york even in austin like places like that you will find startups who have that level of product maturity but they also don't have billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of market capital so they also don't have the same size of problems that these silicon valley companies have so these silicon valley companies have giant market capitalization and high level of product maturity it's just very different. It's very intense and super fun. I feel like I learn a lot every time and I feel like I'm challenged a lot every time I'm there. And it's the same feeling for the team. They all come back like wrecked and totally drained, but like excited about being in this industry. Well, one thing that's, I think, kind of cool about it is there's all this cool stuff that happens inside some of these companies and in Silicon Valley. And it would kind of be cool to share that, the things that they've learned to like Robin Hood to steal from the rich and give to the not rich. And, you know, like in a way, like part of the idea with sharing the design sprint was like, let's share the best techniques. Because a lot of the design sprint stuff was kind of boiled by sprint, was kind of boiled down from the way Google worked. Like some of the things I thought about the culture were the best and trying to kind of formulize that. And I think that similarly, like when... You guys work with companies in Silicon Valley, you can maybe like bring some of the things that you see that work well. And of course, not everything works well, but bring them some of those things that work really well to other places, you know, because working in both environments, it's actually pretty rare. Are there that many folks you can work with who have the experience of doing both? We're the only one by AJ and Smart. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I mean, actually, the other thing I was going to say is, there was a few things I thought of. One is like, I think it would be interesting for you to talk about how you started that. Because, you know, you're actually like, 
you're running this agency in Berlin. Now, okay, sure, you've got all these clients in California, but like that's not an obvious growth path. That's true. It's like Berlin to Silicon Valley. I think for me, honestly, the reason AJ and Smart works in Silicon Valley is because I wanted that to happen. For me, it felt like a way to highly differentiate AJ and Smart from other agencies would be having clients from Silicon Valley working on well-known products. And I thought that there wouldn't be much point trying to compete just like within Berlin or within Germany or something like that. And I was always excited about it. And I don't know, I wanted to like expand my product knowledge and all of that kind of stuff. And the first client we had was actually Udacity, that the company that makes all the kind of cool courses. This was like a relatively long amount of work to get that client, the very, very first Silicon Valley client. It took a while for us to be able to make that happen. How did you make the first contact? Berlin and San Francisco does not overlap that much. Not not at all. Except for this podcast, really. This is the only connection point. You know I'm a bit of a schemer, and I've talked about this before. I've heard that you were. (laughs) (laughs) So, like, usually, first thing, as I said, I wanted it. I wanted American clients. That was my first target. You got to want those American clients. I wanted those American clients. You got to want them more than anybody. What got me wanting American clients was going to this conference called 99U in New York. And the level of discussion here is something like I want to be more involved. People were excited about what they were doing. People loved their job. Designers were just, they knew so much more than me. And I was like, fuck, I want to know this. I want to have this level. And two years before, maybe three years before, I'd met this guy called Dustin in another conference. The reason I met him was because I decided to skip the conference because it was so boring. And I was hanging out at a bar with Michael having a drink. And this guy was there with his laptop. We were in Germany and this guy was clearly not German. He was Canadian. He was like, are you dudes supposed to be at the conference too? And I was like, yeah, but it sucks. And so we chatted with this guy for a while and he was like traveling around the world. And his dream was to move to Silicon Valley. And I was like, fuck, you know, that would be really amazing. So he visited me a couple of times on his digital nomad world trip. And I was just always like really nice and friendly and, you know, always a very accommodating, h- hanging out with him and stuff. Wow. That must have been hard for you. I know, man. I'm a, <laughs> and I was always like, you know, letting him use our workspace as well at AJ and Smart. Because I was like, also, we don't have so many connections to the Western Hemisphere, or whatever it's called. Finally, I saw that he got a job at this company called Udacity. I contacted him because I saw that Udacity was based in the Bay Area. And I was like, is there like anything in there that you could see that a company like us could do? And it took approximately one and a half years of on and off conversations with him and with his superiors and with other people in the company, doing one or two free things as well, just to kind of prove that a company from Berlin is worth bothering to even talk to. Actually, the reason I was coming to San Francisco, if you remember, was because I was coming to speak at this Udacity conference. And that was then the first time I actually went to Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the door opener. That was like the beginning of it was working with them. Then we did a sprint with them maybe three months later. So this is interesting because that was, you came to do that talk and that conference. It's like early 2017, right? Yeah, February 2017. We're in 2018. This is not like a decade ago. No, not long ago. Like a year and a half ago. So it's a really long burn to thinking about that idea and then getting your foot in the door, so to speak. I spend so long on these things, man. As soon as I got really into the design sprint. When's the 99U conference? About six years ago, I think. Six years ago. Okay. Slow burn to that Udacity connection. But then since then. Yeah. And then obviously, like, I'm very aware that Like, I never think about, okay, we're doing this project now. Obviously, we have to do a good job. But my goal here is to make sure that I'm really making good connections with these people and they see that I'm a person who's reliable and can make them more successful. So I made really good connections and good friends with a lot of people working at Udacity. And because of those connections, I now have one of the big clients, which I think would have been basically impossible to get to without that connection, because we're too far away. It's just like, it's that we're just too far away. And the other big Silicon Valley company that we're working with is because of you as well. So the second door opening (laughs) was meeting you. It wasn't like a side thing. Oh, I'll meet Jake when I'm over in uh, San Francisco. There was like a big initiative within AJ and Smart to figure out how to get GV and you to somehow, somehow be connected with AJ and Smart. But we didn't know. We just knew, like, for us, GV was the only company we thought was doing design well because we were really, like, specific and blunt about the way we work. And we were like, okay, if we want to model ourselves off anybody, it's, like, GV, the way they talk about themselves and the kind of process stuff. 
and so GV was definitely like the only company we had when we were like benchmarking and thinking about where we wanted to go, even though we didn't even bother thinking about any of the investment stuff, which is the main part of it. <laughs> <laughs> GV without the money. <laughs> yeah, GV with no money. That's AJ and Smart, okay? And also no investing and none of that other stuff. And since then, obviously, you know, we've been doing a lot of work together. You have connected me with loads of companies. My connections at Udacity have connected me with loads of companies. And then those companies spread. And also, super important, people forget that people leave companies all the time, right? So don't be a piece of shit. <laughs> that's just so important. Like, yeah. No, that's a big deal. I mean, that is a big, big deal. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to this podcast. Listen, one thing that I need to give you some context on is that I've been sitting in this room. Now, it's a different We're doing The outro is in a different location. We're crazy here at AJ and Smart. It's so hot in this room that I've gone completely insane. So I can't even, I can't even do the simple sentences that I'm supposed to be doing. But look, if you liked this snippet from the podcast, I guess this is what it is. Um, make sure you just check out the real podcast. It's actually called Jake and Jonathan now. It used to be called the Product Breakfast Club. Um, if you want like kind of it's every Monday podcast, kind of that kind of stuff. And I actually can't think. So here's the thing, right? We have so much we have so much content coming out all over the place, it's even hard to keep up. Subscribe to this channel for videos every Tuesday. Subscribe to the podcast, Jake and Jonathan, for episodes every Monday. Check out our Instagram, at AJ Smart Design, Monday to Friday, videos of behind the scenes of this agency. And just believe in yourself, that's all I ask. I thought that would go more towards the camera. Bye-bye, everybody.